Sir Peter Leach, the mad butcher, is someone we all know. He's made a fortune selling sausages and promoting his own enthusiastic brand of Kiwi nationalism. Sir Peter, in common with so many other Kiwis, feels deeply about Anzac Day. So what sort of family did you grow up in? Oh, good family, working class. Youngest of seven children. Three of them have uh, gone on to the happy hunting ground. Unfortunately, um, mum and dad have gone and uh, we were brought up in Newtown. Family very important to you? Ah, uh, yes it is, your family is. Uh, you don't realise how important family are until you're down in the dumps a little bit. Like I've been a bit crook and my wife has been outstanding, you know. Um, but yeah, no, look, I had a good family. You know, we, we didn't have a lot of uh, flash stuff. You know, we were working class through and through. Um, but there was always a feed if you come to our house. My dad would always give you a feed and that sort of thing. So you left school very early at 15. Yeah. Did you leave feeling gung-ho and ready to conquer the world or were you a little bit reticent and, and um, oh, no, nervous I, about your no, lack of education? I don't think I had any hang-ups. No, I didn't have any hang-ups, but you know, <laughs> jobs weren't easy to get when you're not that bright. So I, I, I worked for the... Uh, p and stores, used to have to get 30 signatures to send a roll of toilet paper to the Newland Post Office. I knew that wasn't going to work. Then I was done the delivery telegrams, done that for a while. Then I saw a job advertised for a butcher boy in uh, Newtown. So I was lucky. I was the only bloke that ever applied for the job, so I always got the job by default, you see. So Charlie Yeoman's butchery in Seaton, I got the job. I was the only bloke applied. Started. They said to me, go in the fridge and get the liver. Well, two things. I was too scared to hop in the fridge and I didn't want to touch the liver because it was horrible looking. But the passion for the meat industry grew. And I can honestly say I just love being a butcher. I loved it. And then you get to meet the people and you meet all sorts. You know, I remember David Longy used to come in the shop, the Prime Minister, buying pig trotters. Can you imagine some of those white fellas looking at him buying the pig trotters? You know, the Prime Minister of the country. You, you say, you know, that, that you're, you're not smart, but you actually are incredibly smart, aren't you? You, you have a, a lot of street smarts. Yeah, I, I'm not educate smart, but I have a very close friend, Murray Decker, and he always says to me, you're the smartest, you're the smartest street smart guy I've met, you know, and uh, I've lived on my wit, you know. When you start a business and you're not educated, you've got no background in business, you know, you've got to learn very quickly. You know, but I was lucky my mother gave me good advice. Treat people how you want to be treated yourself, and that's what I've done. I, I tried to give people good quality meat at a reasonable price. And, you know, the name wasn't the smartest name in some ways because mad butchie you sort of think of rubbish. But in, the reality is I've sold some of the best meat in the country. And is fun important to you? Oh, I think fun is very important. I, uh, I've always had a lot of fun in, in the shop. Not as easy. I feel sorry for young people today. It's so PC now, you know, I really feel sorry. Like in, when I started butchering, you'd, you'd, you'd have a cup of tea and next thing you'd go to the toilet and you're peeing red and ha, oh, 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 you know, you'd go home and you'd go to the doctor and the, the boys at work would put a pill in your tea, you know, and things like that. Well, you can't do that now because someone's liable to sue you, you know, and, you know, it's just, I, I just think we've gone PC mad, mm. absolutely PC mad. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that you've, you've managed to build an empire of butcheries at a time when, when so many independent butchers are going out of business because of, of competition from supermarkets. What... Well, I didn't have my head up my ass, to be fair. I read the market. You know, you only... Look, you only fool yourself if you lie to yourself. You know, I didn't do that. A lot of people, you know, they have a business and they say they're going well, you know, and they're not. You've got to be honest. I saw a bloke just on Monday who I thought had a very good business and I said, how's business? And he said, oh, not bad, Butch, but tough. And as we walk into my car, he said, oh, I'll be honest with you, Butch. He said, I've just sold my house to save the business. You know, honesty, you see. And a lot of people fool themselves. They, they lie to themselves. I've never done that, you know. Yeah. Mm. Um, you do an awful lot of public speaking now, don't you? Are, are you a naturally confident <laughs> speaker? Um, mate, let me tell you, I pooed my pants the night before. No, I'm not. I, uh, I get very nervous. I do it because it's like a test match. I liken it to a, a Kiwi or an All Black playing a test match. The night before, you get really uptight, nervous. 
then you get up there and if you have a good game, you feel like a champion, you know? And uh, just recently I done one for Fidelity Life in Rotorua. And to be fair, I had to be driven down there because I'd been crooked, but I couldn't cancel it because I, a friend had asked me to do it. It was a paid gig. And um, I got two standing ovations. And I mean, you, you've, in the public, you know, you just feel great, you know. But no, I'm not confident, no. I, I still get, you know, very nervous. Do you force yourself to do those things? Uh, I wouldn't say I force myself, but I pick and choose them a little bit, yeah, mm. yeah. Do you enjoy the public? Um, I do. You, do you oh, enjoy being, being in, in the limelight? I love being a little star. I never want to be John Bailey or John Ho Judy Bailey or John Hawksby. I'm happy at the level I'm at, you know. And the reason being that I can do things for people. I can change people's lives. I can put happiness into them, you know. Uh, just today, I, I've had two requests to do something for people, one with a brain tumour, another for a young lady that lost her legs in Christchurch. And I believe by doing something, I can put a smile on their face, be it for half an hour or whatever, you know. Um, and so I enjoy that part of it. I, I get an enormous uh, pleasure out of that. I, I get, you know, enormous pleasure to, to make a difference. Because you, you've just recently brought um, a, a bunch of rescue workers up from Christchurch mm. um, for, for the weekend. Brought 60 up. It yeah. was really emotional. Got another uh, 15 coming up. Uh, yeah, that was very emotional. Uh, they have been through a bad time in Christchurch and I just wanted to do something. Couldn't afford to fly everyone up. So I, I, got, I rang the uh, ambulance, the fire and the hospital and said, give me, you know, 15 people. And they picked... Of course, a lot of people were a bit disappointed they couldn't make it. But, uh, yeah, no, it was uh, very emotional. You've got enormous contacts, haven't you? Um, you're, a, you're a great networker. This, this enables you to be able to do those things. To, well, to I don't know if I am a networker. I just communicate with people, you know. I don't, I'm not into that, you know, bullshit language, you know. I just, you know, talk to people and I thank people and... Uh, yeah, I've, yeah, I, you know, that's what I do. A generous, warm-hearted person. Well, look, I'm not a knight in shining armour, you know. I, I do what I can. I mean, I sent an email to Owen Glenn today and uh, thanked him for the million dollars he gave. And when I'm sending, I just thought I was going to put, I wish, I wish I had a million dollars to give, you know. But, I mean, you know, good on him. He just led from the front and he's done a lot of good stuff. And I got a nice email back from him, actually, which was quite nice, yeah. Now, you've been married to, to your wife, Janice, for 45 years yeah. now. Um, what part has she played oh, in major. your Absolute business major. life? In? Absolute major. Absolute major. The backbone. When I was working long hours, when I started, I used to leave home 4 o'clock some mornings, get home at 7 at night. I'd ring her, tell her I'm leaving the shop. I'd pull up the drive, she'd open the door, my slippers would be at the door, my tea would be on the table. I'd sit down, watch TV, she'd run the bath. And I don't say that as a male chauvinist, I say that in the greatest respect. When I've been sick, unbelievable. Because you have, you've had a, a lot of health problems lately. Last two years have been a bit of a problem. Had a knee yeah. operation and had some problems. The cancer and I might have a bit of prostate problem. You know, but mm. she has been... And she's had her own battle. She's had breast cancer. And uh, she, I, funny, you know, you're married to a person for a long time and you don't know them. When she um, got a breast cancer, I was the manager of the Kiwis and I offered to give the job up and she said, keep it. Made a bad mistake. I should have given the job up, you know, but you can't turn the clock back. But what I learned is how strong she was. Man, she's strong. Woo! Yeah, she's Who really strong. Who wears the trousers in the marriage? Um, to be fair... Bit of both, really. We both have our uh, areas, you know, and um, yeah, no, we. It's uh, we've never had an argument, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Pigs might fly. <laughs> yeah. um, now, of course, you know you're, you're best known as a, as a passionate advocate of rugby league. Um, what what motivates you in all these dealings with sport? I don't know, to be fair. I, if you look at rugby league, it started at Mangry. The local club come and used to buy a bit of meat. Then they said to me about sponsoring. 
I didn't know what sponsorship was. The guy said, well, you give us a meat pack, we'll give you a plug at the club. Done that. Then he said to me, why don't you come down and have a beer? So I go down there and whew, my sort of people, working class, drinking the old grog, and uh, oh, it'll do me. And then, you know, I just started to follow the team and got to love it. And then that led to the Kiwis and, you know. Because you're not particularly sporty, are you? Well, I'm certainly not, uh, I haven't, you know, wore the jersey, but I was the manager of the Kiwis when we beat Australia 24 nil. I must put that in there. <laughs> um, no, I'm not, uh, I've never been a great, I wrestled a little bit in Wellington, played the softball a little bit, but no, I was never big, you know. Winton, Winton Rufus said um, that it's not so much the sport, but the enthusiasm of the people who play it that, that has hooked you in. Would that, would that be fair? Yeah, look, it's, uh, I just love the people. And, you know, I've, I've liked all sport. And it goes back to that, you like the help. I've been able to help, you know, I was patron of Manukau City Soccer for many years. Uh, you know, I've helped out a whole lot of sports, you know. And, um, yeah, I get satisfaction out of that. And, you know, I'm now kayaking with the All Black coach, giving him a few tips for the World Cup. Yeah. Now, you, you do have a philosophy that says um, if you want to be great on the field, you have to be great off it. Can you explain, explain well, that bit? You, you, you've, got to, you've got to set your targets high on and off the field, you know. You can be a great player, but if off the field you're a low life, it's not good, you know. I don't believe in this that players are role models, you know, like two players got arrested the other night for peeing in the street and, you know, TV said, oh, it's a scandal. Absolute rubbish. I've peed in the street hundreds of times. Mate, when you've got to go, you've got to go. It's not a big deal, I, you know. Um, I'm talking about the bad stuff, you know. That sort of stuff is not, you know, that's just, you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But, you know, you don't want to be getting into fights and, you know, converting cars and that sort of thing, you know. But we all learn, you know. We all, we all make mistakes. I've made my mistakes. But we must never punish people indefinitely. I believe you're entitled to a second chance. When you're trying to enthuse other people <laughs> in the team, what, what sort of things do you tell them? What sort of I tell things them my do you life. dwell on? I tell them my life. I tell them about the cancer. I tell them how I, when the doctor told me, I went out in the car and I cried. I tell them those things. I share my life. That's what it's about. Nothing more, nothing less. I share my life. T tell me about that. Tell me about dealing with the cancer. When you think you're bulletproof, it's hard to deal with. But people every day are dealing with it. I went, and Janice come with me, we went to see my doctor, and uh, he said, we've got good news and bad news. I said, well, give it, it's, you know, give it to me. The bad news was I had a uh, rare form of uh, bladder cancer that's very aggressive. The good news, we had it early. And um, we've been able to contain it. And um, I go back in a month's time and, you know, fingers crossed. And, uh, I mean, the world just, whew, it's incredible. Came tumbling down. Oh, get out the car. Get grandchildren. You've done, you've got things you want to do, you know. And, um, yeah, it's a real shock. I suppose everyone, you know, suffers in different ways. Not until, not until it happens to you do you understand. Like Janice had it. And due respect, I didn't understand as much. You know what I mean? And when it happens to you, it's something completely different. I've, I've tried to be compassionate to a lot of people in my life, but it's different when it happens to you. My brother had bowel cancer, and there was talk he might have to bag, and I said to him, oh, you don't worry about that, mate, means bloody nothing. When I thought I was gonna have a bag, oh, put the shits up me, you know? So, you know, as you go through life, you learn. So every chapter in the book, of my book, has been a learning curve. So, what, how do you deal with it, though, Peter? How, how do you move forward when you get that sort of news? Just got to get on with it and, you know, try to enjoy every day to the max. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, you've got to be positive. You can't throw the towel in because I believe in positive thoughts. I believe if you want to win the fight, you can win the fight. I, I made up the story and I use it. <laughs> I'm going to share the secret with you. I say to people, 
John Walker never started a race and said he was going to lose it. John Walker, every race he started, he was going to win. Now, I've never asked John that, but I tell the story and it's a good story. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a man you've got to have the most respect for. He's got a, a bit of ill health. Does it knock him over? No, he keeps going. And so you've got to admire him, you know? Yeah, fantastic. And giving back, does that help you at this time? Oh, no, that's been my culture from day one in business. I've done that from the day I went into business. I think I've always been reasonably generous, in, you know, in my time. And if I've got a quid, I'd always shout around. You know what I mean? I, uh, I get a little bit more emotional now, I think. Yeah. Not many people know about your um, community work with suburban newspapers. Can you tell me about your, your triumph with the Glue Ear? Yeah. campaign. That was one of the greatest... I've done two great things, I think. That and bringing the people up from Christchurch. Lady come to see me, said, look, I don't know if you can help, my boy's got glue here and it's a problem. Live in South Auckland, can't learn at school, gets naughty, blah, blah, blah. So I said to the trust, we've got to do something. So I then went to the doctors, the anaesthetists, and said, I want to do something, but I want you guys to do it free. Doctors done it free and they just took a donation. And we uh, cleared, I think it was a 12-month backlog or two-year backlog in two weekends. Incredible. Yeah, but it was a team effort, you know? Yeah. And you organised cars to go and yeah, pick well, these people up? Yeah, well, that was the local up. Rotary or JEC. I'm not sure who it was now, I'm sorry, but we we we, we done that. Then we had a follow-up about a year later and it was... Uh, it was a great thing. It was a great thing. I always remember a guy on the trust from suburban newspaper papers. Was his name was Barry Leach, and he liked, used to like to play the villain, you know, the hard man. Mate, he was the first there on the day and the last league. Me and him swept the car park when everyone else had gone. We swept the car park, but it was a uh, a, a very special day. And uh, I've had people come up to me and say to me, I "Want to thank you? My boy's not in trouble anymore. He can hear, you know. It was pretty special." Can we talk about Anzac Day now? Have you, have you always observed it? Oh, yes. Yes, it's passionate. Why? Because, mate, they gave their life so I could live. Very simple. No other reason. Should never, ever be tampered with. Did, did you always celebrate, um, commemorate Anzac at, at home as it, a child? In my own way, yes, in my own way. And I used to go, sometimes go down to the services. I always remember I saw a shop open before lunchtime one day and I'd give that shopkeeper plenty. Gave him plenty. Wasn't a New Zealander and I gave him plenty. And I was very tempted to put a rock through his window but I restrained myself. And that wasn't that long ago, to be fair. I think that um, particularly the new people to New Zealand must understand that it's a day that we honour the people that gave their lives so we could have a life. And... Uh, you know, it's a very special moment. These poppies mean something, you know? And, uh, you know, those old diggers, oof, unbelievable. Unbelievable what they gave. Now, you were honoured yourself um, last year <laughs> with a knighthood. What did you think when you picked up the phone and got the call? <laughs> I thought someone's pulling the leg. <laughs> the butcher getting knighted. No one says that F word more than I do. And I haven't said it for you today. Um, I'm the only public speaker on the circuit that gets paid to say the F word. You know, I said a speech the other day and I would have said it 15 times. And they gave me a letter telling me it was the best they've ever, the best speaker they've had at their conference in 15 years. You saw the letter. Um, I wasn't sure. I mean, I, I thought, gee, it's a great honour. I accepted it in the end on behalf of the working class people, because I think that's what it's about. You know, um, there's a couple of other people I think they've done it for too, like Susan DeVoy uh, and Colin Meads, you know. But, you know, when you look back on the knighthoods, a lot of them were upper class, you know, sort of people. And I think, to be fair, I think I'd be the most common that's got one, to be fair. You know, I mean, I am a, you know, like, I'm a rat bag. I get, you know, drunk in the boozers and bloody, you know, carry on like a lunatic you know, um, and to get anointed. But I, at the end of the day, I, I took it for the little people of New Zealand because I, I think that's what... I like to think of myself as the people's person 
And I think that knighthood, because I couldn't do anything without those people shopping at my shop, supporting my charity functions. I'm the captain of the boat, you know what I mean? But without the team behind me, it doesn't happen. And so, you know, if people hadn't come into my shop and brought meat, I couldn't have supported the Mangry's Talks or kindergarten or whatever, you know. And I genuinely believe the knighthood was for them. And when I do public speaking, I take it and I share it with people. I don't, de I don't lower the standard of it, but I share it because I believe it was for the working people and I want them to touch it and be, be surprised how people get a thrill out of doing that. And you proud? when you think that you are Sir Peter? When you think, about, you think back it. to that little butcher shop that you started in and now I, you're... I think I'm the only one that plays on it. I mean, I had a bloke come up to me the other day and said, G'day, Butch, how are you? I said, excuse me, it's Sir Peter Leach, if you don't mind. Sir Butch. And he's real back, he's real back. <laughs> oh, and he's really, oh, I'm sorry, mate, I'm really... I was only joking, you idiot, you know. Um, I play with it. Um, I mean, I don't care what people think. Call me, you know. Uh, when people talk to me about it, I say, oh, in official functions, I, I, you know, you should refer to me as sir. But any other time, whatever you like. But I, I really don't care. I mean, it's, it's look, it's been... Uh, I don't want to degrade it, but I've had fun with it as well, you know. Uh, the Prime Minister actually asked me at a function if I was going to accept it, and I said, look, I don't know because, you know, I do say the F word all the time and... You know, that there'll be some people would be anti that. And he said, Look, yeah, that's, you know, that's there. But we, he said, We looked at that and we look at the good work you do, and that's down here, good work's up here. And he said, Everyone, you were, you know, unanimous, you know, so, yeah. Politics, Peter. Never either politics or religion. Now, I'm at changed. this time in your life, I'm changing. You're changing. I think John Key has done a one outstanding job. I uh, I said to him one day, I, I might come out of the closet and you know publicly support National. He laughed. He said, Oh, you don't need to do that. Um, I, I think that through Christchurch, he's done an outstanding job. It's not easy. It's uh, everyone can do it better, but give them the mantle and see how good they can do it. Everyone used to tell me how, how they could run the butcher shop better than me. And let me tell you, no one could run it better than me. Well, time, times are hard, aren't they? And um, people need um, leaders to look up to. And maybe this is time. Judy, no, oh, no, no, I'd never get into politics. Oh, no, not me. No, 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 no. Politics, no, definitely not. But I, uh, I do think that times are very, very tough now. I think that we will be uh, recovering from the earthquake for a long time to come, a long time to come. And uh, we're gonna have to make some hard calls. You know, some people are gonna have to get off their backsides and, you know, pull their weight. And we're gonna have to sort a lot of bludgers out, to be fair. You know, because there's a lot of people that need help, that genuinely need help. And uh, I think uh, John Key's the man to do that, to be blunt. I genuinely believe that. If you could um, give some encouragement to, to people who are going through really tough times at the moment, and there are a lot of people struggling, um, what would you say to them? Oh, keep the faith. There's always someone worse off than you. I've been through, the last six weeks, I've been through hell with my knee. And I'll be blunt with you, I've been through some depression and I really got down, you know. And when I was getting down, I would think of the people in Christchurch and I'd snap out of it. But, you know, I was in a spiral and uh, that, that helped. I just thought of the people of Christchurch, you know, and there's always someone worse off. You may live in Christchurch, but think of those people in Japan where, you know, your house might got a wreck, but over there the whole village got the man. The whole village is gone. So they're worse off. So you, you, and that, see, out of every negative, there's a positive. So you turn it around a little bit. Yes, Christchurch has been a disaster. Yes, you know, you think you're hard done by? Think of Japan. Poof. No comparison. You have four gorgeous grandchildren. Yeah. What would you hope to have taught them about life? Oh, just to be good and, you know, to be yourself. 
Don't care what people think. Be yourself. That's I think that's one of the good things in life. And you know, like my mum, treat people how you want to be treated yourself. You know, yeah, they are lovely. You'll get good kids. <laughs>